When the holiday season arrives, I have this tradition that I'm sure many of you also have of rewatching some of my favorite sagas. Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, Indiana Jones, Spider-Man. This year, I watched Star Wars. The original movies and the prequels are a no-brainer. They make me feel like a kid again. I experience excitement, anticipation and glee just at seeing the title scroll. Only this time, I kept watching all the way into the Disney Star Wars content. And I have to confess, it was rough. These movies did not make me feel like a kid. They made me feel like a child. Walt Disney agreed to pay $4 billion for Lucasfilm. Wow, we can make a lot of money. The biggest opening in the history of cinema, The Jedi. Now, if you do anything that's not a sequel or not a TV series, they won't do it. And it really shows an enormous lack of imagination. Let's be honest, the original Star Wars movies are not without their own faults. But this feeling was new to me. At first I thought, maybe it's just me, maybe I've outgrown Star Wars over the years. I thought that just as the prequels were silly movies that I enjoy, the sequels were probably the same for a new generation and I just didn't get it. But even as I watched other content, such as the acclaimed series The Mandalorian, I couldn't shake this feeling from the back of my mind. And as the show advanced, it became clearer and clearer to me what that feeling was. Weirdly enough, if I had to describe it, I guess it's the same feeling that you get when you're watching Dora the Explorer. The show is designed for children. And it is a brilliant show in that it engages the audience by asking them to identify the things on the screen and point them out to Dora. Could you check the map for us and find out how to get to the big hill? In essence, this is the type of piece of media that assumes that you need your hand held in order to enjoy it. And that it needs to provide you with constant stimulation and explanation in order to keep you hooked. Otherwise, you will lose track of things and subsequently lose interest. For every problem, there is a ready-made answer. For every challenge, an almost immediate solution. If the characters need something done, then all I need to do is yell at the screen and bam, it happens within moments. This is something that happens again and again in Kenobi and in the new series Ahsoka. And I never thought I would say this, but I could only watch impervious heroes mowed through nondescript goons so many times before I returned to the only spin-off that seemed to be straying away from the usual Star Wars formula. We're going to get there. I'll tell them what happened. I remember how shocked I was back when I first saw it. It felt different. Ruthless espionage with no loose threads, contraband, guerrilla tactics, fallible, morally ambiguous and emotionally exhausted people. All of it has made me firmly believe that Rogue One and Andor do a better job of showing the nature of the galactic civil war than any other piece of Star Wars media has to date. It is no secret that one of the quintessential ironies of the original Star Wars is that it is not a war movie. It's a space opera inspired by the campy sci-fi magazines, serials and movies that preceded it. I mean, we call it space opera, but people don't realize it's actually a soap opera. And it's all about family problems and that kind of, it's not about spaceships. An adventure where a chosen hero rescues a princess and gets a medal at the end. As beloved as the movie is, its narrative reads like a story for children. In the words of director Irvin Kirshner, Star Wars is more akin to a fairy tale than a conventional sci-fi story. And that is fine. To be clear, saying that Star Wars is accessible to children is not a criticism. This is and has always been by design. 
Contrary to most sci-fi, which uses distant futures and imagination-defying technology to offer insights on philosophically charged subjects like transhumanism, the limits of scientific knowledge, and the human condition across time and space, Star Wars has always opted to keep its main narrative beats accessible to people of all ages. For instance, normally in science fiction the existence of artificial intelligence allows for adult themes to be explored. In movies like Blade Runner or shows like Battlestar Galactica, intelligent machines serve as mirrors to humanity and make us question the very idea of sentience and free will. Meanwhile in Star Wars, robots are rarely more than light comedic relief and guilt-free chaff for our heroes to cut through. Likewise, the endless narrative possibilities that alien species provide, which are explored in franchises like Star Trek or Warhammer 40,000, ultimately end up sidelined, and non-humans seem to exist mostly for cosmetic purposes, or again, for comedic relief. Some may accuse Star Wars of being a superficial piece of science fiction because of the conscious choice not to delve further into these sci-fi staples, but I think that this is an unfair expectation. That is because, to the humans of this distant galaxy, the concerns remain very much the same as those that we presently have. It is probably why we can relate to them so much. More than anything else, the story of Star Wars is driven by humans. And at the heart of the story, there are always human themes and ideas. The most fundamental of which is the conceptual battle of good against evil. In other words, there is no room for any other sci-fi themes in Star Wars because the war in question has always been the war between the light and dark sides of the Force, between the Jedi, the Sith and those who fight alongside both of them. These are the themes of an epic fantasy translated into a sci-fi setting. And in a universe torn by perpetual struggle between good and evil, there is little room for other subjects besides those involved in this battle. And this is never clearer than during the Galactic Civil War. But Rogue One and Andor confirm intuitions that we did not know we had. Like that the Rebellion could not afford to sit and wait for some hero of prophecy to bring down the Empire or that opposing the Empire did not necessarily make someone into a hero, or even into a good person. This is what makes Tony Gilroy's Rogue One and especially Andor so different from other Star Wars media, and what makes them so refreshing. The themes of casual, indifferent and cruel oppression, of compromising one's morals for a greater cause, of forsaking one's future for that of others, fit within the conflict of good and evil while also expanding it. And this is in part what makes a show like Andor more adult. One may accuse Tony Gilroy of losing the spirit of Star Wars by alienating the part of its audience that is more enamored with the fantasy aspects, like the lightsabers, the Jedi and the Force which, while more appealing to children than dramatic narratives, are also beloved by adult fans, myself included. For this reason, I want to discuss what I think is what made the original Star Wars so good and so successful. And before we can move on to that, we need to address the elephant in the room, which can only be done by answering a very simple question. Why does Star Wars only feel childish now if it was always meant to be accessible to children? Saying that Star Wars is accessible to all audiences does not mean that it is childish. But to pretend like Star Wars was always intended for children is reductive. Even in the original movies, we can already see glimmers of something more. The Empire Strikes Back is a very distinct movie from the original, a sequel that clearly sought to expand the universe while also making the characters more complex. Most importantly, the choices made in this movie unequivocally de-infantilize the world of Star Wars. There is stuff behind it. It's not just a space battle. There's more to it than that. In the opening Battle of Hoth, we finally get to see what a ground war looks like in this universe. 
and that the rebels are fighting in an unfair struggle where even after destroying the Death Star, they are still at a disadvantage in terms of logistics, budget and military technology. This theme of unfair, overwhelming odds translates into the narrative beats of the movie, which has no problem taking its time to show us the triumphant heroes of the previous movie at their best, but also at their lowest. This in turn allows us to get a better understanding of the characters. We notice that characters do not act like fairy tale characters, but as human beings. Han Solo does not side with the good guys because he believes in the cause of the Jedi or in the righteousness of the rebellion. The reason the smuggler can't bring himself to leave is that his friend Luke needs him and most importantly, he is in love with Leia. His choices are based on fundamentally human emotions. He is not playing a role in a story, but rather acting as a living, breathing part of a world. Likewise, we empathize with characters like Admiral Pitt, a man working for the evil Empire who is hopelessly subordinated to Darth Vader and forced to play along with his cruel Sith games. The movie takes its time to show us the perspective of the Empire in order to highlight that there are people working just as hard as the rebels on the other side and that despite their allegiances, they too are human beings. Another delightfully real thing about this movie is that, for the first time, we get to see the unexpected moments of downtime and preparation of these characters. We see Luke eating his rations, we see Han repairing his ship, we see Leia briefing the pilots before takeoff, we even see Vader dealing with the banal inconveniences of the chain of command and taking his helmet off. Not to mention the plethora of background characters doing, well, background things. In between the lightsaber battles, space dogfights and scenic planetscapes, we catch glimpses of moments that make the galaxy feel lived in and make the characters feel real. This, one could argue, is what separates Star Wars from other blockbusters like it and what gives it an edge over the competition. And of course, everybody went out and made spaceship movies, and they were all horrible. You know, there's more to it than that. You can't just go out and do spaceships. Even if the narrative is very straightforward to keep it accessible for audiences of all ages, there is a depth to the world and its characters that keeps us wanting more. And this depth is what kept adults coming back when children were mostly concerned with funny robots, cute aliens, and cool lightsaber fights. However, when watching Star Wars media in the Disney era, it feels like these elements are what is being prioritized at the expense of a deeper narrative and characterization. What we see instead is a constant effort to build the IP by injecting cameos, easter eggs and catchphrases, almost as if to distract us with nostalgia. I like this thing. The truth is that, most of the time, the plot is advancing in an artificial, pre-planned way and the dialogue is mostly serving the purpose of pushing the plot forward rather than being organic interactions, which has the unintended consequence of making characters feel stiff and unnatural. Uh, the location of the Wayfinder has been inscribed upon this dagger. At times, it feels like there is a planned void space put into these stories for us to laugh, cry, or otherwise interject. This makes the story into a fairy tale, and a fairy tale, while not necessarily being a bad story, is very clearly not real. So what makes a story feel real? For me, there are two essential things that Andor does in order to capture us within its world, to make us feel invested in the story and make the characters' experiences relatable. First is the visual storytelling. The choice to do over-the-shoulder camera angles, almost always at a human height position. The decision to shoot on location and to have the main environments be a limited number of carefully built set pieces. The minute attention to detail and subtle world building of its set design. All of these things come together to synergize in such a way that it is not hard to believe that every location we see is as real as the characters within it. It feels like the show took the lessons from Empire Strikes Back and applied them across the board. 
Andor is not abandoning the spirit of Star Wars, but rather taking iconic elements from the franchise and reframing them in a new way. Let us take a look at some scenes from Andor and compare them to other existing Star Wars media to prove this point. There is an immediate difference in the feeling of danger conveyed by these scenes. He's at hand. No, no, no. No. Hand. No, no, he means what? <laughs> the simple mindedness of the droid can be used for comedic relief, but it can also be used to make it into a terrifying machine without empathy or common sense. Director Benjamin Karen is not only laying the groundwork for K2SO's future appearance here. He wants us to feel powerless before the indifferent violence of the Empire. The same can be said for the TIE Fighters. When you are lucky enough to be piloting the Millennium Falcon, they die like flies. But once you're on the ground with nothing to your name other than a couple of blasters and John Williams' soundtrack is not playing in the background, TIE Fighters become far more threatening. Especially when Susanna White directs the shot to be almost like that of a horror movie. These are only two examples, but the same logic applies for the choices in direction, editing and cinematography across the entire show. The second key element that makes Andor so special is the dialogue. Andor doesn't just tell us a story. The interactions between characters in Andor don't feel convenient or forced in order to push the plot forward. The conversations feel real, and subsequently they make the characters feel real, and make us connect with them, make us understand them, their motives, their emotions, their place in this universe. The guiding principle in Andor is always this. Show, don't tell. Show us characters in their day-to-day -day life, down to the logistic conversations they have and the unexciting personal choices they make. Seeing Dedra taking pills and doing overtime tells us more about her than any amount of exposition could ever do. Seeing Cassian's reaction to Val and Terramin's ignorance regarding the load clutch in the box freighter makes it obvious that there is a difference in practical experience between him and them. In seeing Cyril's conversations with his mother, we understand everything there is to understand about his insecurities and where they originated. Show us, but don't tell us. Exposition may clarify things, but it could never give us as real and intuitive an understanding about these characters as we can get from seeing them eating, walking, talking, living. As we watch Andor, the showrunners make us look for the story threads that are weaved by these characters instead of offering them to us on a platter. This is a much more efficient trick to keep adults engaged in a TV show. If we look at some of the most acclaimed and influential TV shows of the last two decades that were made for mature audiences, we will find that they all have one thing in common. They are all shows where, regardless of the quality of the main narrative, what kept audiences coming back for more were the characters and the world they lived in. More specifically, the way in which the world they live in and the experiences they go through affects them and changes them in a way that feels real. Through these characters, we can understand why the story is being told to us and why it is being told through them. Andor's cast of characters is one of its greatest strengths as a piece of media. Not because they are iconic or memorable, but because they are fundamentally tied to the key ideas explored by the series. They are multidimensional characters, and this doesn't just make them more interesting, but also allows for the show to tell us its messages without needing to rely on exposition. This is because these characters are not just telling us a story as if we were children who did not know any better. Their words carry weight because they remind us of the harder truths with which we have become acquainted over the course of our lives. We resonate with their words because, like us, these characters are just people at the end of the day. And only people can live through something real. There 
is a wound that won't heal at the center of the galaxy. We are health care providers. We treat sickness. The Empire is a disease that thrives in darkness. There's a growing list of things we've known and forgotten, things they've pushed us to forget. Things like freedom. The Empire has been choking us so slowly we're starting not to notice. So much going wrong, so much to say, and all of it happening so quickly. The pace of oppression outstrips our ability to understand it. We put a number of options on the table, and they're so wrapped up in choosing they fail to notice. You've given them nothing they thought they wanted at the start. The arrogance is remarkable, isn't it? They don't even think about us. <laughs> they're so proud of themselves, they don't even care. They're so fat and satisfied. The way they laugh, the way they push through a crowd. The sound of that voice telling you to stop, to go, to move. I want you to die. It's in the air, doesn't it? In turning away from the truth I wanted not to face, we were sleeping. Casa. 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 I just need you to wake up. You can stand to see the Imperial flag rain across the galaxy. It's not a problem if you don't look up. It's better to leave, better to eat, sleep, do what you want. You want to die being careful. If there are heroes brave enough to take on a whole Imperial garrison, I'm brave enough to stick it out of here. People are standing up. Random acts of insurrection are occurring constantly throughout the galaxy. And even the smallest act of insurrection pushes our lives forward. Remember that the frontier of the rebellion is everywhere. Do you really think the rebels care about the lines we draw on maps? Security is an illusion. The Public Order Resentencing Directive is the next step on an all too predictable march toward complete, unchallenged authority. Authority is brittle. Oppression is the most of fear. Neither fear, neither coming down hard. I want everything out here. Show a force immediately. You realize what you said in motion? People will suffer. That's the plan. Oppression breeds rebellion. Don't you want to fight these bastards for real? And what do you sacrifice? I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago for which there's only one conclusion. Be all right. I'm damned for what I said. You're willing to burn him. I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. There's no way out alive. Of that you must be sure. So what do I sacrifice? Everything! Tell him he knows everything he needs to know and feels everything he needs to feel. And when the day comes that those two pull together, he will be an unstoppable force for good. I mean, all the heroes I can get. What have we done, Val? We've chosen a side. We're fighting against the dark. Making something of our lives. This is what revolution looks like. We're playing straight into their hands. Whose hands? The rebels. We're treating what happened like a robbery. What would you call it? An announcement. It's calling war. The real shock will be when they discover how ready and eager we are to respond. How tight we close our fist. They just killed the hundred men to keep them quiet. I call that power. Power. Power doesn't panic. If the Empire has this kind of power, what chance do we have? What chance do we have? The question is what choice is there? There will be times when the struggle seems impossible. Alone, unsure, dwarfed by the scale of the enemy. Free.
freedom is a pure idea. It occurs spontaneously and without instruction. You think anybody's listening? I do. Someone's out there. What is it they've sent us? There comes a time when the, the risk of doing nothing becomes the greatest risk of all. Maybe fighting is useless. Perhaps it's too late. But I'll tell you this. If I could do it again, I'd wake up early and be fighting. These bastards from the start. Fight the Empire!